All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us, either live on Zoom or later on our YouTube channel. And for the fifth and final um, one of Dana's awesome hour-long programs to start us off in 2024, and today talking about the human evolutionary journey. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dana. Thank you so much for um, putting us into perspective. And it looks like you just need to hit one more slideshow button to right that yeah so it, it when uh when you started recording it flipped back to the smaller vision and hmm. it's uh if i go to slideshow it's it's paled out it's not it has no life to it it won't increase in size now i could try new share i don't know what that button is oh i see here we go that better Yep. Ta -da. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Well, okay. So everybody, thank you for joining in. Whoever's here, I can't tell who's here. <laughs> uh, I'm in, I, I want to say, I'm in over my head on this. I've actually given this talk before. I pulled up an old program and I worked it over. But there's, there's just so much information and it's so intricate and confusing but I can tell a basic story here. And the basic story is that life is on a journey. And we don't, you know, when we get up in the morning, we don't tend to think of it in that way. So I think anytime we reflect on what we've learned about uh, life on planet Earth, it offers a perspective that has value. That's, I think, that. However well or poorly anybody can give the presentation. So I have some information here that, that really is, I find, is stunning to me about the context of life on Earth. And that is that you remember that uh, certainly humans didn't know we were on a planet. When we learned we were on some sort of a planet, we assumed we were in the center of the universe. It, it was a huge disappointment <laughs> to learn that the Earth went around the sun and uh, vice versa. They killed a few people who suggested that. And then we learned that we were embedded in a galaxy that we call the Milky Way galaxy. And that was kind of disappointing. We're on a, one of the outer arms. We're not even anywhere near the center. Uh, just that that powerful uh, drive to, to be near the center, to be at the center, to have importance, to have importance. It's reflected, if I may say, and I'll just touch it lightly, in the drama of human relations in the news these days that drive to have identity, to be somebody. And the best way to be somebody is to overwhelm somebody else, if you know what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> I was looking at the distances. Um, I don't know if I can grab them here. The Milky Way galaxy, we don't know how many stars it has. The estimates go as high as 400 billion. Nobody can count them. That's our galaxy. There's now estimated to be 2 trillion or more galaxies they're basically infinite in, you know almost an infinite number of stars in each galaxy almost an infinite number of galaxies the space between them is unimaginable it's measured in millions of light years light travels at 186,000 miles per second it's incomprehensible so i thought it was summed up a bit by werner heisenberg who uh, was a theoretical physicist very famous got the nobel prize he says not only is the universe stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think. Uh, I think that's the case. That's the starting point for Homo sapiens, us hum humans, trying to understand the context in which we find ourselves. And um, you know, science has done a good job of, of covering some of the basic information. I'm not sure it's we're any more oriented <laughs> with the scientific information. So. That's a hydrogen atom. We've seen it before in this program. Hydrogen has one, one proton and one electron. But the shell, the orbital holds two electrons. Well, that's where all the trouble starts. <laughs> and why? You know why? I have no idea why. It may be that a physicist understands why that shell holds two when, when there's only one proton. 
and the electron, the electrical charge is matched by that one electron. In any case, it holds two. There's a certain strong proclivity for it to join with other electrons. I mean, excuse me, other atoms to form molecules because of the design, because of the built-in design of the hydrogen atom. So the it does appear that the universe appeared suddenly from its they like to say it appeared everything appeared from nothing in a single instant. Somewhat true, but in the early universe, the evidence is there was just hydrogen and helium. And so now there's 94 naturally. The periodic table comes up here. You can't really see it, just illustrates the fact that there's a lot of elements, but there weren't. There weren't. So so the main point really is that the universe is emergent. I like that word, emergent. It's not done. The universe is not done. It's in a constant state of emergence. So here's a here are the here's the periodic table down there in the middle left. 94 naturally occurring elements, some a few more elements at the bottom made by or somewhere in there made by humans, but 94 naturally occurring elements. But there were only two, possibly a little lithium, which would be three, in the early universe. Where did the rest come from? They emerged. They emerged from the evolutionary cauldron, the evolutionary fire. What does that mean? They were they were forged in the center of stars. Our, that's a picture of our sun on the upper right. Our sun is burning 600 million tons of hydrogen a second. And it's been doing that for 4.5 billion years. I mean, that's just absurd. There's no way the human mind could grasp that kind of quantity and power and force. It's 93 million miles away, and that's what heats the planet, even though it's that far away. If it was closer or further, life would not be possible on Earth. Well, so it turns out it's not the only star in the Milky Way. We now think there's up to 400 billion of these stars. The stars are forging the other elements. All the other elements on the periodic table were formed in the center of stars or in supernova explosions. So again, I will invoke the word emergent. All the other elements have emerged. Well, you couldn't, oh, here's a, I, I just circled on the periodic table. You can't see it, but you can see where they are. Hydrogen and helium are at the top. That's one proton and two, tron, two, two protons. Uh, one electron and two electrons. It's all very orderly. The universe is extremely orderly. And we come back to that. You could not have planets. Planets are not made out of hydrogen and helium. Planets are made out of uh, heavier elements with more protons and more electrons. They, the elements were forged in stars. So you couldn't have planets in the early universe. First, you have to have, have, to have this stellar fabrication of the of the larger elements so it's this is i like to say an electron sc scanning microscope picture of bacteria obviously it's not really just a joke but but life appeared you can't have life without a place to for it to live you can't have life without planets you can't have planets without forging the elements in stars so it's an evolutionary journey it's an emergent process life emerged so that's I pulled up that picture of sunlight and leaves. It's photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the single most important metabolic activity on the planet. It's where 99.9% .9 of all the food comes from. Photosynthesis. It didn't used to exist. There wasn't even a planet for photosynthesis to exist on. Life is on it. The whole universe is on a journey. That's a eukaryotic cell instead of a prokaryotic cell, larger, more complex, evolved over time from the dynamics of the universe. That is, I think that's a redwood tree. Redwood trees are the tallest organisms on the planet. Over, There's a few that are over 400 feet tall. They're um, a related species. The uh, sequoias are the largest mass of organism, uh, massive organism on the planet. The General Sherman tree is the largest known single living thing on the planet. And it weighs, I don't think I can find it here, like 4 million pounds, something like that, just gargantuan. And somehow in this process, and this is art from one of the caves in France created by early Homo sapiens, our species. And the point is somehow in this evolutionary process of the universe, symbolic thought. 
has emerged. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad, actually, but that's a symbol. That is not a real buffalo. It's a painting on a wall. And actually, as we touch on later, even language is symbolic. So I showed this last time. I'm just reviewing the fact that we live on this dynamic planet, that the center of the Earth is 10,000 degrees. The center of the Earth is the same temperature as the, uh, the outer shell of the sun. So how is it possible that we live here? Well, it cools off <laughs> as you move outward to the outer crust, and the outer crust is not very warm. But if it weren't, if the center of the Earth were not 10,000 degrees, there would be no plate tectonics. If there were not plate tectonics, life would not be possible. I would call that a Goldilocks effect. I think you're familiar with that term. Science actually uses that term now. I mean, it sounds like a fairy tale, but they're referring to, in the fairy tale, everything's just right. Chair was just right. Soup was just right. Bed was just right. Everything on Earth is just right for life in incomprehensible ways. I mean, the list would be endless of things that are just right for life. This is temperature over time. The top picture is 180 million years on the right. Uh, 180 million years, yeah, down to on the left, the present, and then the and then the 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 present, the last million years is enlarged in the second picture down below, or 800. 800,000 years, it just shows variability, really. Uh, we talked about that before we started the program, that it was 50 degrees in Moscow, Idaho recently, like yesterday or the day before. Things change over time. There was a mile of ice over, over my property 17,000 years ago. And that was one of five glacial advances in the last 2 million years. Things change over time, and life has to adapt to that. Not only do humans have to adapt, can you imagine if, you know, we're, we're always worried about change, but change is built into the system. How did life arise? Well, we're not gonna answer that question, except to say that the orderliness of the physical structure of the planet is built in to the very basic structure of the universe. And we talked about this, hydrogen atoms, <clears throat> Each shell holds two electrons, but only has one. So they just naturally want to, they just naturally elect, electrically are attracted to one another and, and join together and form a molecule, H2. Well, the rest is history. <laughs> the same thing happens with oxygen and hydrogen. It's just natural for two hydrogens to join with one oxygen. They all fill their electron shells. And we, what do you get? You get water. There was no water in the universe, in the early universe. There wasn't even any oxygen. Oxygen was formed in the center of stars. So I used, I showed this quote last time. It's one of my favorite quotes, I think, by a Nobel laureate, Christian Debood. But he says, life may be inevitable because of the order built into the universe. And a, life may be an ob obligatory manifestation of matter because matter complexifies over time, partly because of the, the attraction of the electron shells, of atoms to fill their electron shells. I may have shown this previously, but it's interesting to get a sense of, of the progression, the evolutionary journey of life on the planet. I always have a hard time remembering these. So if, if, if the 4.5 history of the planet were condensed into a year, then life, there would have been no life in the first quarter of the history of the planet. Life appeared, if it's condensed into a year, life appeared in early April. So for the first quarter of the history of the planet, there's no evidence of life. It would have been microscopic. They probably pushed that back a little bit. Humans are inquiring into this and trying to understand, but it's just chemical traces of life when you go back that far. It's not shells or bones or anything like that. But there is evidence for life after the first quarter. Uh, let's see, that is photosynthesis appearing Halfway through the history of the planet, photosynthesis appeared. Well, as you know, I like to say it's critical. Photosynthesis creates almost all of the food on the planet. If you had breakfast this morning, it was the product of photosynthesis. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and that's true for the 20, 20 million species on the planet. They all have to eat, and most of them eat the energy captured by photosynthesis one way or another. 
uh, photosynthesis. Oh, that's life appearing on land. So for nine tenths of the history of the planet, there was no life on land. It was difficult. We don't know how life appeared, but it was in water. For almost all of the history of life, it was difficult for life to adapt to land. The, the evolutionary story of living organisms is largely a story of life adapting to land where there's no water. And even the human body is like 60, over 6% 6 water. We're just bags of water walking around. But you have to retain the water. It'll dry out and become a dried apple person. <laughs> I circled December 31st. Humans appeared if in the 4.5 billion year history of the Earth. Humans appeared in the last couple of seconds. So we think a lot of ourselves, but we haven't been here very long. This is a, a drawing out of Darwin's one of Darwin's notebooks, I think probably in that time frame, he must have, maybe he was on the, he might've been to the Galapagos in that time period and on his journey, was he on a, on the Fitzroy? What was the name of that boat? He sailed around the world. He went to the Galapagos. He began to see that life had radiated outward, that life tended to be interrelated and had evolved over time. He wrote, I think, that life is a radiating shrub. So we looked at this recently, and this is a slightly more sophisticated image of the radiation of life over time. And so I'm going to circle down at the bottom. Luca, last universal common ancestor, the, the chemical evidence and, and genetic evidence is that life only appeared once, totally unknown how it happened and has rated outward since so that all life on the planet is related. I had the interesting experience, I don't know whether to delve into this or not, but I have this friend uh, in Moscow that I met when she was 10 years old, back in 1950, 1985, when I took some students to Russia. And uh, she wanted to participate, but I forgot to send her this link. She invited me to talk to some high school students because I like this evolutionary story and I got so in Moscow. And so we had a Zoom with these high school students and they started asking me about supergroups. And I didn't know what supergroups were and I still barely know, but I've looked into it a little bit. And it turns out that animals in some evolutionary renditions now, humans and fungi are put in the same supergroup because of chemical similarities in their evolutionary journey. Well, I mean, that's a little odd, a little, but they are there on a similar branch of that simple tree, fungi and animals. Anyhow, that's in part to say, it's in part to say that Russian high school students are pretty bright, but also that any representation of the branching shrub of the evolution of life is just a representation, whether it be simple or complex, it doesn't capture the whole story. The next picture is much more complicated it's kind of fun to look at, but hard to figure out. So Luca's is still there. I'm going to circle Luca down at the bottom. But that's, you know, it gives a little more of a sense of how varied the evolutionary journey has been. All those are all branches on a shrub of life. Life constantly radiating outward. It starts with eukaryotic cells. We talked about those. Bacteria and archaea over there on the left. And then eu eukaryotes appeared. Eukaryotes are symbiotic cells. They're cooperative cells. Even one eukaryotic cell is a cooperative cell of organelles. If you remember that story, that were incorporated from outside to inside the cell. Endosymbiosis, they call it, life inside the cell. So life is, we're unfortunately have to touch on this, life is may eat itself, but it's also highly cooperative. It also likes to diverge. And so now we have where there was no species, one species, now there's 20 million species on the planet. Somehow Homo sapiens arrived out of that down there at the bottom right. What's it all about? Well, it is about eat, survive, reproduce. That is true. And whether we can expand beyond that, <clears throat> well, I forgot I put that in there, but it's about, it's, it is about interrelationship. And here's an effort to talk about some interrelation. What's it all about? It is about competition <clears throat> for energy, for food. Things don't offer themselves. My table does not set itself. I have to go get the food. Often I grow it. 
but everything eats everything else. And that's a good image of that. And it's rough out there, as we know. But life also is highly cooperative. What do we have? <clears throat> I think we have 50 trillion you know, human cells, 50 trillion human cells. They all have to work together. They all have to cooperate or our lives would not be possible. Generally, they do. Sometimes they complain. We also have 100 billion bacteria inside our bodies that are not killing us. They're, they're part of our internal ecosystem. And then organisms cooperate with other organisms in various ways. Our next breath, why do we breathe? We breathe for oxygen. Where'd the oxygen come from? It's all from photosynthesis. The 21% oxygen in the atmosphere is all from photosynthetic organisms, probably mostly, well, not mostly plants because algae, which some algae are now considered to be plants, but sometimes they aren't something they are. But I, a lot of the oxygen is from single celled organisms. I'm remembering now diatoms. So I think we talked about diatoms, which are single celled organisms in water produce about 25% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So plants, algae, diatoms are a form of algae. So competition, cooperation, beauty. It's, it's I think, not comprehensible. I don't think, I don't think the evolutionary journey and life on the planet is totally comprehensible. It just is. And we're embedded in it. We're a part of it. So destruction, interestingly enough, is another aspect of the dynamics of the planet. There have been five major extinction events. We don't know for sure what caused them. This, the last one, which was the KT, Cretaceous Tertiary, 65, 66 million years ago. It's pretty well established that a very large asteroid hit the planet. I forget how far, how far, how wide it was, a couple of miles at least, and wiped out most of the life on the planet. So that's pretty pretty rough that's pretty brutal and here is a record in the time scale of those extinction events and these are the major extinction events there are minor extinction events as well but i put the years oh yes this book the ends of the world a fairly new book on this story of with all these extinction events so i put in the years uh, i circled the last one 66 million years ago so the ordovician silurian which was 450 million years ago Hmm. Hopefully Dana comes back. Okay, well, we will wait until Dana returns. <laughs> It's all fun and games until you lose your signal here on the Zooms. Sometimes it helps if we all leave and then come back in. Just just a FYI. Okay, let's see. I'll give him a call real quick. I think I'll pause the recording and then come back to it. So that's, it's interesting that we're dependent on all this electronic gizmo for our lives and for diesel to deliver food to Hank's market. If you live here in the Valley, we don't think much about that. Actually, that comes up in this slideshow. Well, we're not going to go way over time. There's 25 minutes. I think I showed this before. I like it because I'm going to take that back out for a second. The top shows how many 
species of these organisms, these vertebrates there are on the planet, 32,000 fish, 4,000 amphibians, interestingly, oh yeah, 10,000 birds. But the next, the next line, it shows how many of these organisms are in the Methow. And what I like about that is it shows that the Methow Valley is an evolutionary laboratory for life on the planet. You can study evolution in the Methow Valley because all of the orders, if not genera, of organisms exist here. The whole evolutionary story is, is here in the Methow, in the organisms that are left. Or these are all vertebrates, so it leaves out a lot of the other creatures in our tree of life. But there's something happening here. There's more X's as you go along. There is a theme of two themes that I would pick out of here. One is the colonization of land. So you've got you've got lungs instead of gills. That's because you're no longer immersed in water and you need some way to extract the oxygen from the atmosphere. So you need a wet environment. So lungs evolved. So amph amphibians metamorphose. They start out with gills and then they have lungs because the, the word amphibian means two lives. They li live the first part of their life in water. It's, it's, they, they recapitulate the evolutionary journey of life actually. Reptiles are not born in water and are born with lungs. Birds have lungs, mammals, but also warm blooded is the capacity to use to, to harvest more energy from the environment, which really means more oxygen uh, from the environment. Parental care is an interesting one down there on the left of this list of, of emergent properties of life, change over time. Parental care is interesting because it really, it really infers the development of the nervous system, the brain. So these are phylums, phyla, phyla of the animal kingdom. Humans are chordates, but they're divided up in these various ways. We don't need to dwell on this, but there are these various phyla, and we would recognize some of these uh, nematodes. You've heard of nematodes. Apparently, soil is full of nema nematodes, like 100,000 nematodes in a square foot of soil. Some of these things are more common than we would know, but our own phylum is chordates, backbones, or animals with backbones. So we're trying to move in on the evolutionary journey of Homo sapiens here, but it has been a journey. Um, mammals, what makes a mammal? Mammary glands is one of it. They, they Parental care, they feed their offspring milk. All mammals have mammary glands, warm-blooded hom homeothermy, which is really the, 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 the ability to use energy more efficiently and be more active. But the, so we have... Plenty of mammals, I forget how many on the planet, but we have these little ones. So then there's this blue whale, which is arguably, and I think maybe we talked about this briefly, the largest organism that is largest animal that's ever lived on the planet. I actually looked it up and there are some, there's some argument about it. There are some fossil dinosaurs that were a similar size. Now that is impressive because that's a land animal that doesn't have, a, I mean, a dinosaur that big would not have the water to support it, whereas blue whales do in any case I think 100 quadrillion cells in a blue whale that's the estimate 100 quadrillion cells they all work together if you're looking for cooperation there's plenty of it in the biosphere plenty of cooperation placental mammals it's a subclass of mammals most mammals are placental only a few are not but placental is 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 care of the embryo for a longer period of time uh, in utero, so that the or the creature, the offspring can grow larger, the brain can grow larger. As you know, the brain is so big in humans, it can barely get through the pelvis opening. There's a bonobo, and I like to put in there any resemblance. A bonobo to humans is purely coincidental because, you know, it's, we're always mildly embarrassed by reality. <laughs> uh, orders of mammals. So we're just on this journey and of evolution mammals didn't exist that they do now there's more parental care there's characters characteristics of mammals are listed here stereoscopic vision hind limb dominated uh shorter snout because more vision less olfactory and larger brains compared to other even mammal orders they 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 are have a capacity to manipulate the external environment in ways that other creatures don't. Great apes, uh, surprise, there's more than you would, a few more than we would think. There's now three species of orangutans, three species, 
two species of gorillas, a chimp, bono, humans. You can see they have much larger brain cases than uh, other mammals. So humans and chimps, they're closely related. They say we're 99, at least 99% genetically related, split about 6 million years ago. So this is, and then once we split from chimps, there's this line of hominids like Australopithecus, Homo erectus, things we've heard of. So I put in the brain capacity of these different organisms here. The upper left skull is a chimp, 400 cubic centimeters of brain capacity, Australopithecus. That was Lucy, you remember Lucy? I mean, somehow Lucy became famous. She was an Australopithecine, not much different than a chimp, slightly larger, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. So interestingly, Neanderthals generally had slightly larger brain capacity than our own species. And they, we, I talk about them in here. We're going to have to go through this fairly quickly. But here's Lucy, the Australopithecines. Um, she, it, she seemed to walk upright, but didn't seem to have the bone structure for the kind of walking that we do. Uh, small brains, uh, but capable of thought, symbolic thought of turning external reality into images inside the brain case. This is one example of that. I have this Amanaponscott pebble, very famous pebble. I happen to have it here. Here's my Amanaponscott pebble. I'll sell it to you. Um, this was found in a cave in South Africa mm, quite a while ago, early 1900s. But it was in there with Australopith Australopithecine bones. And, but it's a it's a manuport. It's it was it, it was this was not created by humans. It's a natural object that has somehow the the image of what we would translate as a as a face, a human face an Australopithecine face, it was carried into this cave. The, the rocks that it came from are known to be about 20 miles away. So there was no way for this rock to get into that cave without having been carried there. It is, I wish I could remember how old it is, but it's probably 2 million years old. It's considered to be, by some, the first evidence of symbolic thought in the human evolutionary line because it was carried into that cave by an Australopithecine who had the idea that it looked like his wife or his children or himself. They didn't have mirrors. I guess they could look at one another, but they couldn't look at themselves. It's just, it's, it's, it had to be a thought to think that this resembles somebody. And so this is more, more the evolution of symbolic thought. These are tools made by hominids over time like homo let's see i pulled i have them oops sorry more i think things are supposed to come up here they're not doing it oh it's written in there so the first one on the upper left is probably a uh, homo habilis who was a tool maker but very simple tools they you have to that's how many chops 17 chops there to make their tools they couldn't go beyond that but they at the beginning if you're going to fashion a tool you have to have an idea of the object you want at the end when you're finished with your work at the beginning so they have to have they have to project ideas in their brain of what the future will look like so there the early homo erectus tools took more hits to create them they were late homo erectus on the lower left more sophisticated 65 neanderthals 100 and cro-magnon which is our species homo sapiens almost 300, they created these very sophisticated tools that took a lot of symbolic thought to, at the beginning of the process, to create these tools. So you can see the evolution of the capacity for symbolic thought over time with these tools. Here's Homo habilis, 202 million years ago, uh, with their 17 strikes to create these very simple tools that they could use for digging, possibly for hunting, Homo erectus, who had, I forget how many strikes, up to 50, something like that. More sophisticated tools. Up to 50,000 years ago, found actually out, these, well, there's a picture here. They went out of Africa, the first homo species to go out of Africa. 
they tamed fire. There's a great book called Taming Fire about Homo erectus utilize, cap, figuring out how to utilize fire to their own benefit, probably possibly first for light at night to keep the lions from eating them <laughs> because they were they'd be they were they were down out of the trees on the ground very vulnerable to to large carnivores and but fire scared all the other large mammals and then they started cooking food and you get a lot more nutrients out of some food most food if you cook it certainly meat and some vegetables roots if you cook them which made more energy and more nutrients available in their diet and allowed the brain to continue to expand. This is energy use over time. We might have looked at this previously. Homo habilis on the bottom didn't use fire. So it's slightly chopped off, but it's 2,000 kilocalories a day. That's just the food we eat. It goes up with Homo erectus hunter-gatherers to 5,000. Why? Because they started using energy outside the body started burning hydrocarbons in the form of wood to augment their lives so the energy use went up early agricultural har harnessing animals to help harvest hydrocarbons in the food early industrial and now this is actually out of date it's probably it says 230,000 for us we probably use three 300,000 kilocalories a day it's all petroleum it's all fossil energy captured by the sun 100 million years ago and it is finite we don't dwell on that in this program but it would take it would take some symbolic thought to <laughs> realize the situation that we've got ourselves in this is homo erectus two million years ago up to fifty thousand years ago that's when they existed migrating out of africa it shows you how far they're evidence of their existence has been found. Uh, and I think the next picture, I can't really sh show it here. Does this, I don't know if you can see it in the center. It says Demonisi, Demonisi. It's in Georgia, just south of Russia, not the state of Georgia, but the country, Demonisi. This is a Demonisi man. This is a skeleton that was found in Georgia. The, it was uh, the, the skeleton the teeth had fallen out. Not only had the teeth fallen out, but the, the tooth sockets had grown in with bone, which means that this creature, Homo erectus, had lived for a number of years after it could no longer chew its food. And it's considered to be, probably somewhat arguably, the first evidence of compassion in the fossil record because some part of this creature's clan must have been chewing the food and giving it to this man then to eat because it could no longer chew food. <clears throat> so it's an interesting piece of um, fossil evidence for emotions. Neanderthals. So the upper picture in the dark brown shows Neanderthals uh, out of Africa colonizing Europe and uh, part of Asia and then the lower picture shows the dark brown disappearing as Homo sapiens displaced uh, Neanderthals. And that is thought to be what happened, that um, Homo sapiens had better tools, better weapons, and probably displaced, killed Neanderthals. But Neanderthals, Neanderthals were, they, 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 they didn't show the kind of symbolic thought that Homo sapiens shows, but they did engage in symbolic activities. These are shells made by Neanderthals that were strung on a bead and hung around the neck. So adornment, adornment of the body. Well, animals don't tend to do that. Other animals, we are animals, but other animals don't tend to think about how they look. And this is a burial in Iraq, a ceremonial burial of a Neanderthal skeleton in Shanidar Cave in Iraq that was clearly done by the tribe, so it's it's projecting into the future. It's a ceremonial burial. They're thinking about death. They're thinking about what happens after death. Um, hominin sites. I think these are non ape, non non ape monkey sites. The human evolutionary line, and just the fact it illustrates how they went out of Africa. These different sites as they radiated through Europe. Language. There's a cartoon about language. I think it's cute. So he's using his uh, his little thought balloon 
to dig rocks. <laughs> and the other caveman says, no, use it for talking like this. Well, we do not think about language very much. We don't think about the fact that all language is a symbolic endeavor. The squiggles, the little dark spots on that image, they don't actually say anything. It's just lines and circles, but we interpret it into our mind, in our minds, and we agree on the, we agree on the meaning and may or may not be funny. But then we turn it into sound. The same images have symbolic meaning to us and we're able to communicate through the symbolism. So Homo sapiens is immersed in a symbolic universe, really. Putting symbolic thought to work. Uh, I showed this picture before. This is an image of when, when we thought back to about 1200 AD, 1300 AD, back in Copernicus's time, we thought we were at the center of the universe. That is a symbolic image to place ourselves in the universe the other animals are not thinking about their place in the universe but humans do this is the early map of the mediterranean sea the word mediterranean means center of the earth we all think we're at the center of the earth the next picture i think is a little rough but it shows how we demonize the other we want this is a picture of japanese during world war ii pictured as bats like like the Israelis called the Palestinians animals. Everybody does that, dehumanizes the other. Others are bad, we're good. And we're not, a, we're not beyond creating artificial stories with our symbolic mind, making things up to enhance our own standing in our culture. This is a skull that was found in England in, I think, 1912 that proved that a major step in human evolution occurred in England. And all these English scholars were so proud that, that they had this new important place in the evolutionary story of humanity. It was a hoax. It was just made up by some paleontologists glued together with uh, some kind of monkey jaw that protrudes more than our jaw and a human brain. It's not unusual. The humans... Artificial symbolism works for us. We do, It doesn't need to be real. I, that really kind of mystifies me. More symbolism. Let's see. I'm checking the time here. Well, Easter Island, you know about Easter Island. They built a thousand of these moai. This is obviously symbolic. They were highly they organized into clans, on, into, into clans on Easter Island. They settled it. You know, they were Polynesians. They arrived in boats. They were such good sailors. I think they had plenty of evidence that there was land somewhere out there as they sailed across the Pacific Ocean and they were able to find this island. And multiplying numbers, the population went up to, I think, you know, probably 100 might have arrived. The population went up to 10,000. Uh, they they split like our like we do on the, lar on the larger planet into clans, fought with one another all the time, stripped all the trees off, off of the island and then the population collapsed. So that's a graph of their population over time. It goes up to 10,000 and then down to almost nothing. When they were discovered, I forget what century, I think 1700s by, in, by Europeans and sailing ships, they were cannibals eating one another. Humans um, dispersing out of Africa and then out of Asia. How did they get to the so-called Americas, North and South America, they, they came from Asia. That is agreed, they came from Asia. They either came over the Bering Strait land bridge, which was solid land uh, during the last, during the Pleistocene Ice Age. There was so much water bound up in ice that the sea levels dropped like 500 feet. You could just walk from Asia to, to Alaska. And it was even not even ice. There were mega fauna in there, elephants mastodons and things plenty to eat the new evidence is they probably first arrived by boats and that's partly because of monte verde down there in must be chile that's dated now at more than fourteen thousand years so that's a long way to make it from asia it's, it's older than a lot of the other sites and been a lot of a lot of controversy about it in any case the big story is they weren't here, that humans 
because of the way our minds work and we're so curious that we have dispersed all over the planet. <clears throat> the whole planet, really, these are, these are megafauna in North America. Maybe I should just focus on that. There were megafauna all over Europe and Asia 18,000 years ago. So these organisms all lived in North America 14,000 years ago and went extinct by 11,000 years ago. So we had we had not two species of elephants. I think there were there were more. There were like five species of elephants in the Americas 15,000 years ago. Of course, now there's none. Llamas, camels, horses evolved in North America. Um, great ground sloth. That picture of bears, I think the I think that's a comparison of a the front picture is a grizzly bear. The middle one is a polar bear. And the back one is a short-faced bear. The short-faced bears are extinct, but used to live megafauna. There were, oh, how many species? Um, at least 50 species of megafauna. That means species over 100 pounds in North America when Homo sapiens arrived, whenever Homo sapiens arrived. One of my favorite issues of the naturalist did a story on the Pleistocene megafauna. So these are spear points that were found in Wenatchee, East Wenatchee in, I think, 1987. These things are huge. There's a hand holding them. What do you use spear points that big for? Not killing rabbits. So what happened to the megafauna? This is what happened to the megafauna. This is out of one of E.O. Wilson's books. Megafauna on the continents disappeared soon after Homo sapiens arrived. And we're not going to dwell on it, but the evidence is Humans killed them and ate them. That's what happened to the megafauna. Um, those spear points found in East Wenatchee were dated at 13,000 years ago. I was surprised they were that old. 13,000 years ago. That means the Methow tribe was here 13,000 years ago. That is impressive. And we don't know how much before that, but certainly all the way up until when did we drive them out? I forget. Um, in the 1880s, I think. But to think that humans lived here in the Metha Valley without Hank's market, without vehicles, without fossil fuels, and managed to survive for probably 12 to 14,000 years in the Metha Valley. Very impressive feat. She's making, uh, they made uh, teepees out of bulrushes, wove them into mats, and live fire in the middle and keep it warm in the winter although they may have gone down to the columbia but in the winter because the snow was not nearly as deep so humans radiated out of the america out of africa across asia and europe into the americas all humans are related all humans are 99.99 percent .99 related so all of the angst and all of the aggression and all the fighting is really against our own family. It's a sad state of affairs. Brain power, briefly. We are near the end, and near the end of the time. But this dog has tangled itself up, and it is not going to untangle itself. It can't, it doesn't have the capacity for symbolic thought to figure out how it got itself into that mess and how it's going to untangle itself. A chimp, I think they've tested chimps, and chimps can figure it out. They have the capacity for picturing the future. Now, if I did this and then I did this, I would untangle this and I'd be free to go. So this is the, this is the evolutionary command. The evolution command is to eat, get enough energy, enough hydrocarbons to survive and then survive. That means don't get eaten and reproduce. Well, we've kind of overdone that. <laughs> we overemphasize eat, survive, reproduce and underemphasize whatever else there may be to life. But this is just a you know, to emphasize the degree to which we like to eat. It's at some like carnival thing where they're stuffing down as much food as they can in a brief period of time. Survive. Well, we have to keep the enemies away. So now there's like 20,000 nuclear weapons on the planet between Russia and the United States, mostly. And I mentioned I have this friend in Russia, you know, they're the same as us. They're exactly the same. But they're, they're so these there are these biological imperatives to eat, survive, reproduce. So we, we have a tendency to create enemies. It's it's probably only intelligence that's going to count, counter the biological imperative to create enemies. 
world reproduce. Have we been successful at reproducing? There's 8 billion humans on the planet. The other, many of the other species are being pushed off the planet. It's biological to reproduce. It's natural. But so is the evolution of intelligence, also natural. And it's, it's, it's an emergent property of the universe, intelligence. It's not fully developed. Um, this makes, always makes me think of Little Star School because the brain is, this, this is attempting to show that the neurological and vel, uh, connections in the brain are almost completely finished by the time you're five years old. It's all about in utero and the first five years of life. You need to take care of the young to have intelligent adults. We're conscious and we're unconscious. Uh, actually, I have little games I play with myself with this like, and I can see that I just can't remember so many things. So I think the next slide is a little test. Some of you have probably seen it before. I think you're supposed to read the message. And this is just to show something. We'll see if this works. This guy's got a card. You have to read it to yourself. Can't hear you anyhow. So it looks like it says you will pick the red card. If you've seen it before, it doesn't work as well as, as it does if you haven't seen it before. But it does not say you will pick the red card. What it says is you will pick the, the red card. It says the twice. Our brain tends to just delete. I don't know if it worked for you. Can't tell. It often works. In a group, it works with 90% of the people. They don't see the second the because there's no use. We have no use for a second the in a sense. The brain, we can't even see it. The brain just deletes information that's not useful to us. But what that means is we're only conscious of a small proportion of the dynamics going on around us. So this is a reality that said by Albert Einstein, I think this is almost the last slide. A human being, we're part of a whole, but we experience ourselves as something separate. Einstein says it's a delusion that we're not separate. And you know, there would be evidence for that. For instance, I mentioned the, we can't live without oxygen. Oxygen all comes from plants. We can't live without plants. We can't live without the organisms in the soil. We can't live without symbiotic, uh, endosymbiotic cells in our body. So the last line, the punchline is the last sentence. Our task is to free ourselves from this prison of semi-consciousness by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living things. It's a journey. It's an emergent property of the universe to be able to do that. And I think we're all, you know, on the on the road on on the road working on that oops pull back there soparate that means think for yourself <laughs> i like that line well anybody who survived thank you sorry we had that glitch in the middle you know that's a it's a good story it's a real story it's our story it's but know it's not like we walk around thinking about it during the day but it doesn't hurt to try it on for size that we are part of an evolutionary journey in we live in an emergent universe. That's it. The end. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, people. I appreciate it. Yeah, maybe we could go back to the, uh, let's see. Small screen. Stop share. Yeah. There you go. Oh. Many All right. right. Any uh, last buttons. thoughts, questions for Dana? Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Thanks for hanging in here. Thanks, Kathleen. I get your message there. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. Appreciate you hanging in there. Good luck on your emergent journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That ability to, you know... It's a both and universe, particle and a wave, yeah. both true, depending upon the viewpoint of the observer. It's well, feel free to send me an email if you have any comments on anything, if you want to talk about it. It's a com complicated journey that we're on. But it's fun to enlarge the picture, you know, because I know like now I know for my host, well, now I have to go to town and I have to get this stuff at Hank's and I... And I just go right back into this little personal life. But there is this larger context. It's, I think it's very worthwhile to embrace that whenever possible, the larger context.
I think it's really okay. Trans Absolute. Oh, wait, Hi, someone's David. speaking. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that uh, having that larger context is really transforming. It, it, it really changes how we see our lives and how we fit on this planet. And I really thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate the comment. Absolutely. Should I look? I'm going to look in chat, but feel free to check out. We're, we're past our time here. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the recording real quick. But yeah, okay. if anyone else has any comments, hang on. <laughs> oh, Sally, thank you. I don't know if you're still.